Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking the history of ice, historically only available to those people who lived in northern climes, where they could harvest it in the winter and store and use over the summer. However, from the 1800s on, ice became big business, especially in the US. The wide availability of ice had profound human health impacts and economic impacts, and was one of the largest industries in the US by the 1900s. It had its fair share of barons, ice squeezes, and sharp business practices. The ice supply chain employed hundreds of thousands of people, and the ice man was one of the most familiar characters in the early 20th century. Within a few short years, it all went away, with the rise of electric refrigeration in the home. Here to tell that story of another commodity transition is Amy Brady. Amy is the executive director of the Orion magazine. She holds a PhD in literature and American studies, and has won numerous writing and research awards from the National Science Foundation, and is author of the book Ice, From Mixed Drinks to Skating Rinks, A Cool History of a Hot Commodity. Great reading for a hot summer. As always, you can really support the show by leaving us a positive review on the platform you're listening on, or even just click the five stars. It really does help support us. And as always, I hope you enjoy the episode. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So we're talking your book, Ice, from mixed drinks to the skating rinks and the cool history of a hot commodity. And I guess it's the commodity piece that's of interest to, to us and our, and our audience. And, and ice isn't necessarily one that immediately springs to mind anymore, but was crucial to the economic and the cultural development of the world in the last couple of hundred years and perhaps is forgotten in that context. And we're going to go through the story of it. Before we sort of start with the, the, the history and the profound impacts of ice and its, its subsequent demise as, as a, a major industry, what led you to write the book? Well, a few years ago, the world was in the grip of a brutal heat wave, uh, so much so that it strained the energy grid of my parents' house where uh, I was visiting one summer. And it knocked the power out. So we piled into their car and went to a nearby gas station that was running on a generator just to try to cool down. And I filled a cup with ice so that I could have some iced tea to, to further get cool on this extremely hot day. And as I was watching the ice cubes fall into my glass, it just occurred to me that I hadn't thought twice about whether ice would be available there. And I also knew if I had gone a mile in the other direction, I could have gone to a grocery store where I could have bought ice by the bag. Ice is everywhere. Uh, at least it is in the United States. And that's certainly not the case anywhere else in the world. So I was really struck by that. And once we got back and the power came back on, I, I tried to do some research, some cursory research about why Americans seem so obsessed with ice. And I couldn't find a satisfactory answer. So being the curious nerd that I am, I dived into the research and a wild and weird history presented itself. And that history became my new book. Excellent. And it is amazing how ubiquitous ice is in North America. You know, I remember this summer going back to my, my parents' house uh, with the kids and it being a very hot day and there's, there's no ice, right? It's sort of a peculiar American thing in that sense. It has led to some of the, you know, much of the book, the second half of the book certainly is focused on the cultural ramifications of ice. But let's, let's go back to revolutionary United States, you know, George Washington and so forth. You know, it was a very, it was, you know, can we just sort of talk about ice at that time? Because it was a very much an elite thing. It was very much tied to the northern states, the northern latitudes around the world where you could harvest natural ice. Can you just start in that story before we get to the first ice king, Frederick Tudor? Let's start in sort of the 1750s or whatever we might want to pinpoint it. You know, what was the state of the ice, in quotes, industry then? And, and how were people using it? And, and how widely sort of recognized was it as important to health and so forth? Sure. So before Frederick Tudor launched the American ice trade, bringing ice to 
uh, essentially every American territory and state, including the southern areas where ice didn't form naturally, ice was a commodity of sorts that was completely within the purview of the wealthy. And that's because ice had to be harvested from lakes and rivers where it froze in winter. And in order to keep that ice year round, you had to have a space called an ice house in order to store it. And an ice house was not a house at all. It was essentially a well-like structure that went several feet into the ground where temperatures rarely raised above 50 degrees, even in the summer. And if packed appropriately, ice could last down there year round. And in order to have an ice house, you had to have land. And land was only available to the the economic elite, you know, at that time. And moreover, ice was dangerous business to harvest. It wasn't something that the average person had time or the the resources, or frankly, you know, the the ability to harvest themselves. So it was usually done by servants or uh, in some cases, uh, enslaved servants. And you had to be a wealthy person to to have those folks, you know, working on your estate. So it really was the um, the dominion of the wealthy. And it took some time, you know, even after the launch of the ice trade for ice to become the ubiquitous substance that we know it as today that's available to people of almost any economic background. So, so before we launch into the ice trade and this, I mean, it's filled with, again, when you look at the history of these commodities, whether it's whale oil or ice and so forth, these, these fascinating entrepreneurial characters, you know, a world without ice, you know, without any other form of, of cooling was a difficult world for human health, even, you know, without the extreme temperatures that we, we were experiencing this summer. But for human health, and particularly in those southern latitudes, it was a real crimp on the ability for the colonists to expand westward as well, right? Without, you know, into much warmer and hotter latitudes than they, many of them historically have been exposed to in, in Northern Europe. That's right. You know, before ice was everywhere, you know, folks who didn't have access to it wouldn't have been able to use it to reduce swelling or to cool a fever or to cool a drink of, of tea or water. There were going back thousands of years into, uh, you know, to extremely hot climates. Um, you know, there were recipes for making cooling pastes, but even those didn't get to the cold temperature that ice could provide. So they were only so much help. And for folks who did have access to ice, you know, there, there was an understanding that a nascent understanding, I should say, that ice could be used in, in some of these ways. It just, it, just took a while, not until after the ice trade, did people really fully understand and start to fully exploit the power of cold. Yeah. And there is that sort of very enigmatic note in the book about, we know that they made ice in the Middle East 3000 years ago, but I think we're still roughly unclear on how they did that. Right. And uh, we probably know the principles in terms of what we'll come on to in terms of mechanical ice, but you know, a fascinating sort of vignette there that, you know, ancient civilization did have this and recognize its importance. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And to be clear, you know, my, my book does focus largely on the American ice trade, but Americans certainly were not the first people to use ice. Uh, you know, it's been used by all different types of cultures um, for many different purposes for thousands of years. You know, it really is the the colonizing Americans <laughs> that took their sweet time of figuring out how to make and use ice in all the ways that we enjoy today. OK, so let's talk about good old Fred Tudor, who I think if he were alive 50 years ago would have become, or, you know, an oil baron, an oil, a head of an oil trading company. <laughs> let's talk about this character because he's the one essentially who created, as you said, the ice trade which is a fascinating interplay of both having to create a market, there's a lot of resistance to it, lack of understanding in the southern latitudes, and also then figure out how you actually ship, store, and sell this stuff. So can you tell us a bit about his story and take us up to how he got to Cuba and, and started the, you know, the, the modern-day barista as we know it? 
So Frederick Tudor was uh, an eccentric, <laughs> wealthy Bostonian who in his early 20s landed on the idea to carve blocks of ice out of the lake on his family's estate and to sell it to people living in warm climates around the world for a hefty profit. And every one of his peers thought he was mad for even having the idea. There was no historical record of any before Frederick Tudor of anyone shipping ice long distances or, or even short distances for that matter. I mean, anything longer than lake to ice house by, you know, horse and buggy, which just was unheard of. And so they, they thought that, um, you know, he was was mad for having such an idea. And at first, you know, his critics proved to be right. It took him about 10 years before he finally succeeded in selling uh, his ice uh, for a profit. And that was largely because it took a while for him to realize that for people living in places where ice didn't form naturally, to see a piece of ice for the first time was akin to seeing a unicorn. It was this fanciful substance that was cold to the touch that melted, you know, it was ephemeral. It only lasted for, you know, a few hours, if that. So if folks hadn't even seen it, they wouldn't just know what to do with it. So a part of his brilliance was that he created a market for ice by showing people how to use it to make the most delicious things. And he also had to create an infrastructure for ice you know, one of the biggest uh, pitfalls in his original business plan was that when he arrived in the Caribbean, which is where he started this, this scheme to sell ice, it just, <laughs> for a, a Massachusetts born person, it just never occurred to him, there wouldn't be ice houses. There, there, you know, there wouldn't be a means for taking ice from ice houses into people's homes. None of that infrastructure existed. So he had to create a market and an infrastructure before he could turn a profit. And it took a long time. Yeah, I love it when he turns up and people start returning the ice saying, this stuff's melted. <laughs> <But> <laughs> let's take both of those because I think it is it's fascinating, especially I think for the commodities community, right? So let's talk infrastructure. What did I mean, how did he go about saying shipping large blocks of ice, even down to the Caribbean? I mean, these were multi week multi-month journeys just to get to the destination how did they what did he do what ship did he buy and then the the ice houses that he eventually started building in in these locales because the same i mean very quickly the same thing was happening throughout the south as well can you just talk a little bit about the just the nature of how did you pack ice on a ship yeah so he bought his own ship and that was the first of several business mistakes we can start there in frederick tudor's day uh Traders didn't usually own their own ships. You know, they they purchased cargo space on ships that were already sailing along their preferred trade routes. But Frederick Tudor either didn't fully understand this, or he just had more hubris than than you know the the average merchant of the time. And so he bought his own ship, and he went into deep debt for doing that. And then he outfitted the cargo hold so that it could support ice for long distances. And, you know, he, he built it on a string of best guesses um, that, that fortunately for him turned out to be right. And that's that he studied how and why ice can last for months at a time in his family's ice house. And, and remember, an ice house is this deep hole essentially in the ground where ice is stored year round. And in order to keep ice from melting in an ice house, the blocks of ice have to be packed tightly together so that airflow doesn't go between the blocks because moving air acts as a form of erosion on the outside of the ice and it and induces melting. He also made sure that the ice was packed in sawdust and straw, which acted as a barrier to the ambient air around the ice. Think of a giant koozie, <laughs> as we say in the United States, <laughs> yeah. you know, that you'd put a, a beer in. And then ice was also elevated so that it wasn't sitting in its own meltwater because water also acts as an expedient that speeds up melting. And so he essentially recreated those conditions in the cargo hold of a ship. 
he built a platform to elevate the ice. He made sure that it was packed tightly together and coated in straw and sawdust. The ice was harvested usually over the course of just a couple of days so that the ship could take off during the winter months. And, you know, yes, it was exposed to heat once it reached warmer southern waters. But because of the way that it was packed, um, most of Tudor's uh, shipments arrived with about two thirds of the ice intact, which to my modern day mind seems pretty remarkable. But he does turn up and you know, he turns up in Cuba and he's, you know, no one knows what it is. No one's going to no one wants to buy it. And so he starts what must be one of the most effective marketing campaigns in, in the history of business, given where he ended up. How did he go about creating that market? Well, as you know, I said for years and years, nobody would buy his ice. They thought it was way too strange. And so it finally occurred to him, he needed to convince people not just that ice was a value add to their life, but he had to show them in real time how it could be used to, to make these, these wonderful additions to their lives. So he started out by going to uh, baristas and bartenders uh, in Cuba. And, you know, what he had learned from many of his previous trips to Havana was that, you know, nobody on the island had come to trust him, this weird man with these, these ice cold rocks. But everybody trusted their local barista because cafe culture was just dominant in Cuba uh, during this time. And so he went to uh, these baristas, these cafe owners, he gave them ice for free. And he said, I'm going to show you how to use this ice to make, you know, ice cold drinks. And because I'm giving you the ice for free, you can sell ice cold drinks for the same price as your typical lukewarm ones. And let's just see what the the masses prefer. And, you know, you can't argue with a drink on the rocks. <laughs> And sure enough, um, you know, Cubans uh, loved, loved the ice cold drinks and clamored for more. And at that point, the baristas came back to Tudor and said, I need more ice. And he said, sure, let me, but I'm going to sell it to you this time. And over time, his price increased to the point where he started to make a hefty profit after just uh, a year or two. It's amazing how all this story starts off with cocktails rather than with hospital beds, right? <laughs> uh, you know, um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, the, 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 then it, I think it's his um, younger brother goes to, takes that blueprint and goes and does it in New York, New Orleans, you know, where they're mm -hmm. drinking tepid, you know, mint juleps and so forth. And uh, once again, within a, in a couple of years, transformed the New Orleans economy and then the South economy as well. Yeah, that's that's right. You know, when Tudor sent his younger brother to repeat that marketing plan in New Orleans, Henry, his brother's name was Henry, uh, arrived at a transitional moment in that city's history. You know, it was a moment when you know, this, the city had many different types of people from all different types of backgrounds, you know, kind of converging, you know, in the heart of the, the, of the French Quarter. Just, just, and Just give us a time frame here. I realize we probably haven't made that clear. Sure. This would have been the 1820s. Frederick Tudor sent his very first shipment of ice to the Caribbean in 1806. And around 1815 or so, he started turning a profit there. And, and in the 1820s is when he came to the southern United States. And so he arrives. So Henry arrives in, uh, in New Orleans uh, at this time and finds a city that is already experimenting with different types of cuisines, art, music. It's a city that is ready for a magical seeming substance with which to experiment further. And the, the bartenders there took to it very quickly and immediately saw different ways that they could use shapes, flavors, textures of ice to create all kinds of new drinks. And it's just a short time after ice arrives in the city, that we see the creation of America's most iconic, and New Orleans in particular's most iconic drinks. We get the Sazerac, we get the gin fizz, we get the whiskey sour, all of these drinks that are now hallmarks of American cocktail culture that would not have been possible if ice hadn't arrived when it did. And from kind of a, a hapless start, right? I mean, he becomes quite a ruthless and effective 
business person to create an empire. You know, he's crush, he creates a monopoly, he's crushing competitors. He's sort of doing the Walmart approach where he's buying the best land for the, the ice houses. He's sewing up the supply chain. I mean, we're going to come on to the story of John Gorey, but just to get some sense of the scale of what Tudor had built within 20 years or so and its dominance over the ice market and the fact that now this, you know, this market was captive and captured and, and was consuming ever more ice. That's right. You know, from the very beginning, Tudor was concerned about copycat entrepreneurs, and he was right to be. That's why he actually started his business in the Caribbean, because he wanted to see if ice could be shipped, if, if the scheme could actually work. And he wanted to do it at a distance that would have been quite difficult <laughs> for anybody else to achieve. And ultimately what uh, turned him back towards the United States was that now that he had proven that shipping ice was possible, he knew, as he put it in his diary, some enterprising Yankee <laughs> would uh, attempt to do the same thing. And so he wanted to be the person to do it first and, and get that market. Yeah, and, and just give us some sense of the scale at which it had reached by the 1850s when we start to, you know, we come onto the mechanical ice story. By the 1850s, we're seeing hundreds of ships up and down the eastern seaboard and into the Gulf that are uh, that's bringing ice, you know, from the north to the south. Tudor was also expanding to other continents. He was bringing ice to India. That was one of his larger destinations for for many years. And um, this is also a time when we're seeing the railroad uh, industry develop. And it was a very short time between the laying of the very first railroad tracks and the creation of ice cars, where uh, train cars would take ice into the center of the United States and out west. And then on the west coast, trains and ships bringing ice down from Alaska into the western states and territories. So it was an enormous trade that would have that that did bring close to a billion dollars, which I mean, this is the 1850s. So, you know, a billion yeah, is a lot now. Is now <laughs> trillions. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it was huge. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Just to give a sense of the scale, by the 1920s, ice was the, I think, top five industry in the US, right? I mean, this yes. thing is, it's, it's hard to think about it today because of, as we'll come on to, you know, homemade ice and all the rest of it, but that, it was absolutely enormous and great fortunes were made. And now we turn to this, this rather sad, hapless character who probably doesn't, isn't treated like history uh, deserves to treat him, John Gorey, who basically, you know, is a, is a pharmacist in the South, comes up with this, was basically invents mechanical ice, i.e. the ability to use a machine to make ice. And you'd think within overnight, as we sort of saw with the story of oil versus whale oil, this thing would just take over in a couple of seconds. But the reception is astonishing. Can you <laughs> tell us about this, this poor chap? Oh, this poor chap, Dr. John Gorey. So John Gorey, you know, he grew up in South Carolina. He got his doctor degree from New York. And when he graduated, he moved to the tiny port town of Apalachicola, Florida, which is just off the Gulf Coast. And he went there largely because of his memories of what summers were like in South Carolina, which were ravaged by the arrival of yellow fever. And this, by the time Gorey reached uh, Apalachicola, Florida, this was the 1840s. And this was a time when doctors didn't understand that yellow fever was transmitted by mosquito bites. Uh, all they knew was that it got worse in the summer and then it waned with the arrival of fall and winter and colder weather. And so, you know, during one of the worst breakouts in Floridian history, it occurred to John Corey that if he could get his patient's body temperature to mimic the cycle of the seasons, you know, that is, he could get them cooled down, that he thought he could cure yellow fever. But this was the 1840s. The ice trade had only just arrived in Florida, and ice was so expensive at this time 
locals referred to it as white gold. And unlike today, doctors in Gorey's time weren't known for making a lot of money. <laughs> and John Gorey didn't have much. And so he could only afford a small amount of ice, barely enough to care for one patient, let alone the dozens and at one point, you know, a hundred patients that he was seeing at any given time because of yellow fever. So he knew the only way he was going to get enough ice to treat his patients as if he figured out how to make it himself. And so relying on the physics and science classes that he uh, studied at, in medical school, you know, he harnessed the laws of thermodynamics to eventually, after months to a couple of years of experimentation, to create a prototype that could actually make ice. It was a machine that was uh, very slow to operate. You know, it, it's not like you could just plug it in because there was no electricity. Um, it was hand cranked. And so it took a long time. But once the machine was cold enough, it created a massive amount of ice. And he was thrilled. And he thought that when he would announce the discovery of this, of the invention of this machine to the world, that everyone else would be thrilled. But that was not the case. Uh, instead, he was met with cries of blasphemy and with you know, people saying, how dare you create ice? A man can't create ice. Only God can create ice. Headlines appeared in newspapers up and down the East Coast and throughout Florida that he was this crank that thought he could make ice better than, quote, God Almighty. And uh, his reputation was ruined. And Sadly, you know, he, he ended up dying uh, just a few years later of the very disease he hoped to cure. Yeah. And the suspicion is that it was good old Fred Tudor and crowd putting out those ads, right? I mean, they they did a real number on mechanical ice um, to, to maintain their position. That's right. John Gorey died convinced that Frederick Tudor had ruined his life. And, you know, there's evidence to suggest that's true. He, John Gorey made his announcement at a party that was hosted by the local French consul. And unbeknownst to Gorey, some of Tudor's associates, or maybe we call them henchmen, were there when it was announced that he had created a machine that could make ice. And so word got back to Tudor, who did not take lightly any threat to his empire. And what could be a bigger threat to the natural ice trade than mechanically made ice? And so there's there's scant evidence to prove this, but it's still I, there is enough evidence to show that this is likely that it was Tudor and his people that planted those headlines and stories in newspapers that ultimately ruined Gorey's reputation. Yeah. And there's some, you know, there's some more of that coming up, right? I mean, that goes on in the 1960s with the IPIA. But, you know, again, it's just these swashbuckling characters and in, in the commodities world. OK, so so basically, you know, the next 50 years, taking us up to sort of the 1900s, mechanical ice does start to compete with natural ice. And we, we I want to go to New York now and we get this sort of the second ice king, this Morse chap. Who, who does it's a good old commodity squeeze with profound impact. So he basically, well, you tell us the story, the, the, the great New York ice squeeze of 1907. Oh, goodness, Charles W. Morris. So this was a man who came from a, a wealthy family that made their money uh, in the shipping business. And he arrives in, in New York at a time when the ice industry is in a midst of great transition, right? The the ice, the natural ice industry is still alive, not necessarily doing well, but it's still alive. And um, we're seeing the rise of mechanically made ice, which finally did catch on, thanks to Gory's existing blueprints. And so we have, you know, ice being shipped down from Maine, uh, being shipped, uh, being harvested off the Hudson in New York. And we see these ice plants that are cropping up along the Hudson and in you know, throughout New York and uh, the still then separate city of Brooklyn. And Charles Morse sees an opportunity to buy up these various competing small companies and to consolidate them into a large, uh, a large monopoly. And, and that's what he does. He essentially creates what newspapers started referring to as the ice trust. And because he owned uh, almost exclusively every amount of ice either being shipped into or created in the New York area, there wasn't any competition. And so, and there wasn't anybody to 
to really see, you know, what, what he was doing behind the scenes. And so during an extraordinary heat wave, <laughs> you know, during a 1907, or I'm sorry, in the late 1890s, he, yeah, um, sorry, this is the, the, the 1907 is the copper, is the copper squeeze. That's right. It's, it's the copper squeeze. Mentioned. Right. So this is during the, the 1890s. And so there's this extraordinary heat wave, you know, and, and Moore sees an opportunity here. And he, and he says, you know, well, ice, we had an ice famine, meaning the winter before didn't get cold enough to produce much ice. And so there isn't much ice. And so because demand is so high and supply is so little, he hiked the prices by over 100%. And this was a problem because by the 1890s, ice wasn't just a luxury anymore. It had become a commodity, a resource, if you will, on par with coal in terms of importance. Everybody used it to store their food to, for, for medical reasons, um, for all kinds of reasons, to stay cool during heat waves. And suddenly, only the very, very wealthy could afford this life-saving commodity. And thousands of people died in New York City alone. And many more would have died if it weren't for the quick thinking of the New York City police commissioner who decided to take action when no one, not even the city mayor or the New York governor would. What this commissioner did is that he ended up rounding up every single you know, available ice cart that was available. He filled it with ice, any kind of ice he could get his hands on, whether it was naturally harvested or mechanical. And he brought these ice carts into the uh, primarily the Lower East Side, where some of New York City's poorest residents lived, many of them immigrants. And he handed out ice for free. And those residents came out, you know, tears on their face, shaking his hand, thanking him. And essentially pledging their their allegiance to whatever political ambitions he had. You know, he said, if you know, whatever you do, you know, we will support you. Well, as it turns out, that police and commissioner, that is... Theodore Roosevelt, and in just yeah. five years, he would be president of the United States. Good old Teddy Roosevelt. And and, and then, you know, we'll, it's, we can't go into it here, but this, this Morse then basically teams up with some banking friends and creates a, a, a copper trust and does a massive copper squeeze in 1907 that essentially leads to a huge run on the banks and J.P. Morgan, you know, stepping into having to basically backstop the uh, U.S. credit. He, yeah, uh, he, he basically, he's a pretty he, aggressive chap. Yeah, no, Morse, Morse essentially created, uh, was, was, was one of the largest catalysts for the, the panic of 1907. Which, you know, until we get to the Great Depression of the 1930s was one of the you know worst moments in economic history. It destabilized everything for almost two years. And uh, yeah, you know, he he could get away with it because he could until he couldn't. Right. I mean, then, you know, there were investigations into his business practices, but he was a slippery figure and it he eventually ended up behind bars for tax fraud of all things, not, not for these other shady business practices, but for, for tax fraud. And then he managed to weasel his way out of prison uh, a few years later too. So, you know, he was a, a sly shady character. Yeah. But it's fascinating though, isn't it? Because ice in this context, not only led to, you know, made a president, it also kicked off the first antitrust anti-monopoly rules in the US, which would later come to impact Standard Oil and so forth as well, right? ICE was the original instigator of a lot of these, you know, uh, uh, these important moments. But also, I mean, again, it comes back to the scale so easily forgotten today that this was the driving force of, you know, of, of actually being able to exist in places where I live today, right? Houston and so forth. It was all foundational to ICE. All, all of it. All of it. And, and, you know, in a, in a side note to that, that I think is important is that when newspapers like the New York Post of the day, right? Uh, the New York Times of the day, the equivalents of those of the day, um, the Hearst owned newspapers of the, of the late 19th century, you know, they, when they did a story on Morse, they went out of their way to say, we are investigating him not out of antitrust sentiment, but because he's a bad guy. Just because so the few supporters that, you know, Morris had left, you know, accused them of that, you know, because he he did run the ice trust. So, I mean, that that was definitely in the air and um, it did indeed lead to eventually a lot of, of antitrust sentiment. I, yeah, I just find it so interesting that reporters felt like they had to justify 
justify their yeah, yeah. investigation. Well, yeah, they had a few monopolies of their own in the case of the Hearst, right? But the mm -hmm. the other fascinating part of this, again, ties into current themes, is that natural ice's demise was not only because of the cost and the danger of harvesting it, but suddenly as well, around this time period and into the 1920s and so forth, the rivers and streams and lakes of North America were no longer wholesome and healthy to actually harvest ice from and that had a profound impact on on human health and the the, tr the naturalized trade itself so by time we get to you know the mid and then late 19th century we're also arriving at the peak of the industrial revolution and this was a filthy filthy time where factories and farms were releasing their waste and detritus into local lakes and rivers with little regulation and so those natural bodies of water were absolutely filthy. And those were the same bodies of water that natural ice was harvested out of. And keep in mind, you know, this was a time before germ theory was really understood. And so it wasn't clear always that when there was, say, a cholera outbreak, <laughs> it was because of the ice that people were uh, ingesting. You know, by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, that cor even if germ theory wasn't fully understood, that correlation, at least, was starting to be realized. And it had a huge impact on the natural ice industry and gave an opportunity to the mechanical ice companies to market their ice as safer and purer than natural ice. And it was one of the biggest reasons why the natural ice industry ended up going away. Yeah. And then you had developments on mechanical ice with, with using ammonia and you know that, that process got even better and better. And that kind of, le I mean, this is peculiarly American figure, the, the ice man, right? Which you know, <laughs> doesn't sit in, in my cultural heritage in the UK, right? But incredibly important American icon, the, 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 these weekly deliveries across the United States in huge volume of blocks of ice. And so can you just, I mean, the heyday of that, whenever that was, sort of the 1940s, the 1950s, can you just, I'd love to go there and just just how vital and crucial ice was to this global, you know, the U.S. economy and this figure of the Iceman. The Iceman is, is one of my favorite figures who emerge from this history. They reached their peak probably between, you know, 1880 and 1920, though they were certainly still working up through the 1950s. And the Iceman was the figure who completed the cold chain, right? So after the ice was harvested and stored in a corporate ice house or a factory where it was created, the ice man then was responsible for taking these blocks of ice and then bringing them to the customer's homes where they would be put into ice boxes for uh, preserving food and, and what have you. And so like, as you said, there were thousands of ice men working in any given city and they were, you know, really strong, burly people because they had to be. You know, they were lugging 50 pound blocks, sometimes two at a time, often up six flight of stairs, especially in a place like New York, where they would then, you know, heave the blocks of ice, uh, you know, into, into the ice box. And one of the most interesting things I learned in researching this book is that there was a, a nationwide romantic fascination with the Iceman. There are so many popular songs <laughs> during this time that are written about the Iceman with lyrics about housewives falling in love with the Iceman. There are Valentine's <laughs> Day cards with puns about the Iceman. Of course, there's the famous Eugene O'Neill play, The Iceman Cometh, that uh, the title is based on the punchline of a joke that the protagonist tells uh, in the play about his wife having an affair with the Iceman. So there's this, the, there's this kind of romantic vision of who the Iceman is. And I thought a lot about that because the Iceman wasn't the only delivery person during this time period. There was also the milkman, you know, there was the mailman. Um, but what I realized is that what separated the Iceman from these other figures beyond his own physical brawniness was that he w was the only delivery man who actually came inside the house, right? All the other delivery men would leave their wares outside the door. But the Iceman had to come inside so that he could put the ice into the ice box. And it wasn't uncommon for the housewife who was home alone 
right, while her, her husband was at work to offer the Iceman uh, uh, something cool to drink or a chair to sit in and rest for a moment. And this was a time when there was anxiety around women being alone in a private space with a man who wasn't her husband. So it sparked all kinds of anxiety and lustful imaginations, you know, uh, imaginings about this figure. And what's really, really interesting is that we see that anxiety peak by which I mean, we see even more songs, more Valentine's Day cards, more more cultural phenomena during the world wars when uh, more men than ever before were out of the house because they were overseas uh, fighting. One of my favorite cultural artifacts is actually a song from the 1930s, which was later popularized by Ray Charles. The lyrics go something like, we're moving to the outskirts of town and I'm buying my woman a Frigidaire so that the Iceman no longer comes around. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fascinating time period. Yeah, and um, and we should I should say as well we're not really we're not doing the book justice in this discussion in the fact that we're focusing very much on sort of the business side, but the book also has this you know a, a large emphasis on all of the cultural facets and artifacts, as you say, of ice and its profound impact on society, culture, and so forth in 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 the US and beyond. But let's I mean, basically it all just kind of goes away within a de- decade or two, doesn't it? And this huge vitally important industry employing thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people you know just ceases as a result of a technological transition i.e with the rise of electric refrigeration and and can you just i mean tell us about how abrupt that transition was and i love this idea that the the sort of the ice lobby group basically tries to pull out a frederick tudor to to, to stop people <laughs> making their own ice at home Yeah. So the rise of electric refrigeration was the biggest technological change that essentially put the nail in the coffin, right, for the for the ice industry. And we start to see the first mass produced uh, electric refrigerators in the 1920s. Uh, They grow uh, more popular in the 1930s. And then, you know, with the 1940s, with FDR's uh, Rural Electrification Act, we see electricity being brought to areas outside of large cities so that these houses could also have electric refrigeration. So, you know, that that act alone essentially doubled the number of people who could have an electric refrigerator in their house. And that was that was essentially the the end of uh, the ice industry once uh, electric refrigeration was possible and folks were no longer relying on ice boxes, which leaked and you know were were dirty because you know the ice was just it was just a dirty substance to have in their houses and uh, and also the price of ice always varied depending on how much was available due to the previous winter whereas electric refrigeration there was a reliable cost every month you know kind of like we we see today you know sure in the summer months our electricity may go up if we have air conditioning but for the most part we have an understanding of what we're going to pay to the utility every year or every month so the electric refrigeration was it and of course, you know, during these last gasps, the the ice industry was doing everything it could to hang on. There were conventions, you know, with subtitles such as the handwriting is on the wall. <laughs> uh, what are we going to do? And, you know, there was this initial campaign that ultimately, I think, turned out to be for the better, for the good of the people and for the ice industry. But, you know, it was a campaign that basically suggested that to make ice at home was dangerous because you know you needed somebody with the proper tools and experience to create ice without that wouldn't be contaminated and that that wasn't necessarily possible at home but yeah. you know you know by the time we get to the as late as the 1990s though like that's that's actually <laughs> really for the benefit of public health because buying a bag of ice that has been created in a sterile plant versus an ice that was made in an ice maker in the back of some mom and pop shop and you have no idea what the oversight is. That's, that's a, that's a big difference and a risk that I certainly don't want to take. <laughs> yeah. So where, where do, again, there's, there's lots more on the cultural side, but where, where is it today? I mean, where, you know, 
it's obviously now ubiquitous still it's incredibly cheap to produce is it still dominated by one or two players like what's the state of the american the, the ice industry today and is i assume it's certainly no more the lucrative business that it once was well, it definitely looks a lot different. I mean, as an industry, you know, it's not the lucrative business that it was. It's, it's not raking in billions of dollars anymore. But, you know, there are still some uh, some ice companies that are still able to stay afloat, you know, in this day and age. And it's, it's a range. I mean, there are still, I'm speaking to you from my home office in Connecticut, and there are still, you know, tiny mom and pop shops that are still in operation that, you know, make their ice on site, you know, using sterile equipment with proper oversight uh, that sell to local restaurants and um, even to local families who, who want to pick up bags of ice for, say, a road trip or a picnic or something. So it ranges from that to larger, you know, regional conglomerates that, you know, serve multiple states with their with their bags of ice or even their blocks of ice. So, you know, these, these, the, it's still a range. The customer side, though, is quite different now that so many of us have the power to make ice at home, you know, whether it's through an ice cube tray or an automated ice maker in a refrigerator. So customers are largely, you know, restaurants and the hospitality industry that needs to stock up on ice, you know, every day to serve their, their many, many customers. There are still uh, ice sculptors who don't necessarily make their own ice and purchase blocks of ice for for their work. And then uh, even larger, there are you know industries such as you know the fishing industry and the meatpacking industry that rely on ice for shipping and then um, presenting their wares in grocery stores. So ice is still largely sold in those particular areas. Yeah. And then, of course, bags of ice are still sold in, in grocery stores and convenience stores as well. Yeah. Uh, it just reminds me about how much we've left out, right? I mean, the fact of we haven't mentioned that the, the existence of the ice trade in the 18, you know, 1800s onwards allowed the existence of the fresh produce trade, right? I mean, yeah. the cascading impacts on 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 society on commerce are are extraordinary and we haven't we we barely scratched all of that piece but i would thoroughly recommend people uh especially in the hot summer go out and uh, get your book that's available on all good retailers as well as online ice from mixed drinks to skating rinks and a cool history of a hot commodity and amy it's been a really interesting discussion and i really thank you for coming on and uh yeah you know some some familiar commodity stories set in a different time frame and, and, and with different actors but some very very familiar behaviors and uh and so forth oh thank you so much for having me this was fun thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show please give us a positive review on apple podcasts or spotify to find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.